Secrets to the Future. That's the Fenton Perspective every Monday evening right here from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Revolution Radio. Oh, and uh, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. Hi everybody, it's me, the Fedge, host of Inside the Eye and Live. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fetch, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And I'm your host, Jenna Kerr Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson. And today we have a panel with uh, another one of my co-hosts, Karen Christine Patrick, and her partner, Brett Shepard, Brett Collins Shepard, and Dr. Ken Johnston. And we are going to discuss all the various conferences that we've just been at, where I'll uh, we were presenters, and we had tables, and we were dealing with this huge, ever-expanding UFO audience, and the members are becoming more educated and enlightened, and what kind of information are they responding to, and what kind of questions are, there, are they asking? So Janet, Kira, and Dr. Sasha were at Contact in the Desert and Alien Cosmic Expo in June. And Karen Brett and Dr. Ken Johnson were at the annual Roswell event, which is getting bigger every day. I mean, every year, sorry, every year grows. And we certainly live in super interesting times. Dr. Les, what would you like to say before we bring on Karen and Brett and, and Ken? Well, I think this, this panel will uh, be able to uh, further <clears throat> test some of my major hypotheses, uh, which come in the, uh, the category of simulation theory, that is, uh, the universe is, uh, is a fractile, and that everything, every molecule of the universe reflects everything there is, including the creator of all, and that we've now come to a time where the fractiles uh, of um, higher uh, consciousness, that or even those that reside in our genetics, are becoming activated, and we get people like Ken Johnson who are coming forth now, and their mission becomes clear, and uh, Karen uh, Patrick, we, you can, and you, Janet, and so... Uh, we have these wonderful people, uh, and Brett, who's able to see things uh, in the pictures that, that are there that has been most of us been blinded to. And what this is is something uh, fractile is being activated in us so we can see more. We've stood on the shoulders of giants, and now we can really see more. And uh, we've gone to these conferences, and we'll see that there's some of the major subjects that have been really discussed openly are disclosure, the outsiders, and the experiencer movement. Will it be taken over by the fear mongers or by the people that profess love as a way out of this mess? And I guess we'll start with Karen. Karen. Hey. Welcome. Hello. Glad to be on Facebook Matrix again. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. 
Hello. Okay, good. Can you okay. hear me now? Good. Uh, yes, yes. We can yes. hear you. Well, I, I got to be at Contact in the Desert and meet you guys. It was really awesome. Um, somewhere in there we didn't mention that we did an online conference, an Anunnaki subject conference, which I think I, ha- I was able to actually do a presentation. And then I was able to go with Brett and Ken to the Roswell UFO Festival and Conference, which is a hoot. Everyone needs to check that out. It's so much fun. It's, it's everywhere from people dressing up as aliens and uh, their pets dressed up as aliens and also serious, really serious, presenters but they look like they're having a good time and relaxing it's not a very frenetic kind of thing in terms of it's very family oriented people would be very comfortable keeping their families just lovely lovely people that put it on so that was my involvement um did you want to talk to brett and ken real quick or do you want me to just launch in what would you like me to do um what would you like to do? <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just hit the highlights. I, I was at the UFO Congress and uh, got to meet a lot of people that, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's fun uh, people watching, you know, celebrity watching. If you are interested in these topics because everybody's there, like, oh, there's Alejandro Rojas. And, oh, there's, you know, uh, David Hatcher Childress, who's, by the way, a really nice guy. I took a, my daughter is a fan of his. So I said, you got to take a picture for my daughter. So he he took a picture with everybody signed books. You guys were there, um, of course, with all your books, and, and uh, it was really fun. It was really great meeting you guys and getting to know you and, and seeing you do what you do. Uh, you know, it was just that kind of event. Very, It's probably the premier event in terms of the types of people that come there as far as, like, celebrity watching. But uh, it was a nice venue, very, very beautiful venue, and um, just – very interesting topics. They have a film festival that's just top notch where you get to see the early releases of films that are going to be coming up in the next year. Um, I like that what our conference was like a marathon. Like people need to know about this one. We did this conference with, um, portal, is it portals to ascension.org, right? Um, Neil Geyer, um, the, yes, portal, yeah, portal to ascension or ascension, portal to ascension.org. I got it right. So we did yeah. this. Co- yeah, we did a, a, you know, I don't know how many hours, how many hours of it, over eight hours or seven hours, something went like that. Yeah, something uh, like that. Just yeah. incredibly in depth uh, conversation about the impact of the Anunnaki, both in uh, ancient times, you know, it's, it's quite the soap opera of, you know, involvement in ancient times. And then um, just other different aspects. My own presentation was Anunnaki and the Moon because I'd been working with Ken Johnston and had access to some of these things that Brett had discovered. And I was able to share uh, both the ancient ruins that are found on the moon as well as modern structures and to talk about how, you know, it's not just ancient aliens anymore, right? That's sort of a way to make it easy for people to get their minds around alien involvement as long as it was like a long, long time ago, right? But, you know, they're still with us. I mean, it's a very busy uh, galaxy. It's a very busy solar system. We're just out of the loop, you know. But we're on the verge Mm -hmm. of knowing more. And so, um, I, you know, this was in in super in-depth information. You know, I learned a lot from all the presenters. So, yeah, people need to check that out. They can still... Uh, go to that website, find our Anunnaki conference, and watch it on their own time. Uh, probably the most cutting edge stuff about the Anunnaki you can find. And and then um, the involvement in Roswell, like I said, it was really 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 fun. Um, I I was just like uh, they were letting people in at a really regular rate, so it just didn't get overwhelmed as someone running a table. And I was mostly manning a table, womaning a table there. And, uh, so <laughs> it was really fun. I, the people would really listen. I mean, I, they, you know, some would just walk by, hey, hi, give them a card, whatever. Um, uh, but some would really pay attention and really listen to what we're trying to say. And they, some people would go, oh yeah, I knew there was, I knew it. I knew we, there was bases on the moon. I knew they found artifacts. I mean, they, that's what they were convinced of all these years. And I never forget this one guy who, who was kind of lost looking. He was going, we were like, they had us going in a counterclockwise direction from coming into the door. And then when a few people would come out, they'd go ahead and let a few more in. And this guy got to our table, which is like two thirds of the way through the whole, you know, facility. 
And I guess I look like a friendly face or something, but he looks at me and he's from Pakistan or somewhere and he goes, so what is this Roswell thing all about? You know, like he's seen, he's seen the crash, you know, he, by now he's seen all the photographs, he's seen all the, you know, little, uh, crash, you know, retrieval, uh, you know, models and everything. He was like, he doesn't understand it, you know, so I just told him, my opinion of Roswell, it is a real event. Um, there's so many, uh, so much information, so many books, so many witnesses, deathbed confessions I'm, um, of, you know, people who've seen the artifacts and the bodies and everything. And I just said, this is when we know, those of us who looked into it deeply, this is when we know the government had to make up a story and had to lie to us. It's, it's like a marker. So of all the cases, this, this is when we clearly saw the pattern of a disinformation that they began to to quash this uh, UFA story. So he seemed pretty satisfied with that answer. But it was great. And, uh, you know, this is the season for conferences. It's the you know, time of the year. A lot of people getting out. We saw a lot of people heading out to their family, you know, family's destinations from 4th of July because it was 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of July. And uh, I the kinds of questions people ask me, it wasn't like they didn't know something already. It's like they already, quite a few people already knew stuff. It's like they're just trying to gel it in their head, you know, what's this UFO thing about? And I wouldn't say I met hardly anyone who was too much of a debunker. A few people kind of hung around and were, I don't know what the deal was, but, uh, you know, trying to ask tricky questions. It wasn't that bad. Most people were just wanting to hear the information. They just want to hear it straight up from somebody who's, Try, looked into it and give their opinion about things. And I told them, this is my opinion. You know, I, uh, on, did we go to the moon? Yeah, I think we went to the moon. Did, uh, I think, uh, what happened? We, what, we, they found stuff that they didn't want to tell us about. So they began an ob- obfuscation process with the photographs and everything. And here we are. We, 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 we're going to have to have that, some of that come out during disclosure. So, Great events, great people. I was really pleased with the level of questions and interest that was happening at the, all the conferences. Um, so anyway, that's my report. <laughs> I'll pass the talk. <laughs> okay, and who are you passing it to? I am passing it to Ken Johnston so he can set it up for Brett because they got a kind of a one-two punch of their information. Okay, take it away, Ken. Welcome to yeah. the panel, Ken. Thank you very Good much, to hear again, you. Sasha. Good to have yeah, you back. It a, yeah. It was really fascinating. Um, this has been this is actually the 21st UFO festival at Roswell. That they've been continuous for 21 years, and running into people like Travis Walton and Stanton Friedman and um, a, a lot of the very famous people as far as uh, what's going on in, in research about um, UFOs and aliens and things over the past quite a few decades, four decades, decades or more. Um, I, I was fascinated by it. And here we were with uh, all of the old and greats and, and just a little old me, and we had our little table there. I felt very, very honored to be part of, the, part of it. Yet it was wonderful because people were coming over here and telling me after the presentations I gave, I gave three special um, uh, hour-and-a-half talks, and people would come and say, wow, we, we've not heard any of this information. We didn't know that there were bases on the moon. And then they were just fascinated by some of the things that, I was able to bring forward, and, it, it, and then on Saturday um, they have what they call a—I call it electric light parade. It's it's a special parade where they have judges and they judge people in their alien costumes. And there was one really <laughs> really cute one where there were uh, three young little girls, probably t- ten years old or younger, and they had a um, uh, a little tiny spaceship made that was uh, probably made from a wagon, and they all had antennas and on it. It was just really really cute to see how young people are involved in um, the the whole thing at Roswell. So it's it's a, the whole town really gets together. Actually, we went for almost a two-mile parade, and, and there were places where the people were lying the streets of, of as many as eight and ten deep. So it was really wow. special. We really had a great time there. It was grueling. <clears throat> I'll say this. Once we got back, it took us a good two or three days to recoup. So, oh, it's uh, so hot in the desert. Yes, <laughs> I can relate. Yeah. Now, I know uh, Brett had some really uh, interesting experiences as well. We were there, and uh, let him jump in and, and, and kind of sign on. Okay, um, Brett. Hi, Brett. Hello. Hi. 
Um, there yeah, you go. While, while, hi, good. Um, while, while I was at the the Roswell Museum, it was it was really strange, you know, how I felt like I was with my family, you know. And they, these are like research research giants, you know, that are sitting around me, and I don't. I, it, it just feels normal to me, you know what I mean? It just it's just mm-hmm. like normal. And they they come up and they share some information with me, you know, and I I share some information back, and it was really cool because they're like. You know, there was there, there was one I really got a kick out of. His, his name was uh, Frank Kimball, and he was a um, he is uh, uh, an educator. He he's a, a co- college professor at the military school there in Roswell, and he was telling me about the the geology of the the crash site and everything else. And he showed me a picture of this this crash site, and I started doing my you know whatever you call it pareidolia thing with it and putting together the pieces in my mind. And I'm looking at it, and it's, it's telling a story to me, you know. And I said, oh, please give me those images, you know. I'll draw some pictures, and, and um, we'll, we'll try to piece some of this stuff together. Because he, he had um, images that were um, all the way back from um, 1947 till the present, and, um, it, and it shows how they changed geologically, you know, in all of the images. And uh, what was interesting is the the images changed, and so did the content in the images that I was actually seeing with my own eyes. And um, what was um, really um, um, uh, amazing about the 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 whole um, Roswell convention is, is the way people really pulled together, you know, all of this information, and um, they. Um, it was just a very sharing event, you know. And when I when I was um, when when I was um, doing um, some tech work for Ken, you know, um, while he was talking and that, um, he let me jump in a little bit, you know, with some of the information that I had, and it felt really good to get that out, you know. And I get to jump in on this real fast on you there, Brett. Is it one of the things that that came to me and, and I came to realize is that uh, a lot of this. Um, Artwork, as you call it, and I had to tell everybody when they would they would get close to us. I said, you know, now artists use a different part of their brain than those of us that are engineers and pilots. And it's fascinating because if you go back and look at ancient Egypt, and the type of of uh, communications was done with pictures and symbols and things. So um, I'm beginning to see in a lot of the artwork that um, Brett has done is that perhaps this is a universal way to communicate between different species, and I think that's going to be fascinating when Brett's putting it all together in a book that he's working on, it'll start showing this this different form of communication. It was really an eye-opener for me there. Wow, fascinating. Well, I'm, I'm, um, did you have more to say? And then I, want, I just was on, briefly, I was looking at your pictures, and there's a guy... Uh, I guess he has stilts on. I hope he has stilts. Is that the, that tall person really that tall, or were they on uh, yeah, stilts? Yeah, he was a really super nice guy. Yeah, yeah, he was like yeah, 10, he was 10 a, feet tall. And he was on stilts, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, he was. Yes, he was, <laughs> was a man in black with long pants. <laughs> long pants. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 10 feet tall. Uh, that and, just makes him an, an average Anunnaki. At 10 feet that's tall, what so. that, that was interesting to see the scale. There's a, a fellow that could have been as tall as an Anunnaki, and he dwarfed all of you. Uh, I'm going to put that up on Aquarian Radio, listeners. I don't quite have it up now, but I will in a little while. So um, well, they, 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 had, uh, they had hired some some actresses, and uh, they had done such a wonderful job. One was uh, um, I, I don't I don't know her name. I wouldn't say it anyway, but um, she was dressed like um, Dana Scully. From the X Files, oh. and she did such a good job. She was so cool. And and um, there was another lady that Ken actually knew, and um, uh, she she played um, like Princess Leia, and she was walking around and and all that. Oh well, she was playing Princess Leia after she had been kidnapped by uh, Bubba the, the Fat. <laughs> anyway, she had the, oh, um, uh, job of the hut. You know, <laughs> it was a fascinating costume she was wearing. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Yes, it was. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they they were so fun. Um, it, it's funny because um, um, she she had sent Ken uh, the picture of them together and and um, 
Yeah, it was it was kind of nice because he shared it with his family and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> One of the biggest highlights highlights I had was getting a chance to spend a lot of time with Travis Walton. And um, because we had uh, lunch lunch together with him and talk about the the new movie. He's putting out a new, you know, Fire in the Sky type movie that tells more of the truth. You know, we all were kind of disappointed in the way it was portrayed in the original uh, Fire in the Sky movie. And after getting a chance to understand... Travis better uh, just as a as a normal human being was a, a great opportunity and one in which I will remember for a long time. In fact, that we're now they're looking forward to us all rendezvousing together at these kind of functions and things. So I guess it looks like the A team, as I like to call Karen and Brett and myself as the A team, we're going to keep it moving as fast as we can so we can get the word out to everybody. That's excellent. Sash, did you have something to say? And then we'll go back around Robin. Okay, yeah. Uh, so some of the things that I'd like to uh, say at the conference is that, uh, that I noticed there was a lot of discussion about imminent disclosure and whether uh, President Obama will be forced to uh, uh, disclose because uh, Podesta is put, making this a campaign issue that he may or not, may not pull out at the, just the right time to stop Trump. And so there was a lot of discussion of uh, very astute people uh, like Grant Cameron and uh, Richard Dolan and uh, people on that thing. And, and uh, some of the interesting things about disclosure that's come out so clearly is Nick Pope's stuff about a fellow named McKinnon, a Brit who was trying to find stuff at, uh, in the CIA and the, uh, and the military uh, about uh, the secret uh, space program. And he found all kinds of stuff from our uh, secret uh, Mars force and uh, lots and lots of stuff. And of course, the United States wanted to get him for the telling secrets, but the English didn't put him in jail. Then there was this a whole bunch of presentations about the outside influences on Earth. David uh, Wilcox and Mike Barra. They had uh, Corey Good up there at uh, the Desert uh, Experience, Joshua Tree Desert thing. And basically, we start to see there's well documented evidence that not only is there a, a space, uh, are there space fleets involved with Earth, but there's all, they also go in and out of inner Earth. Uh, and that some of the uh, civilizations in, in inner Earth have been actually saying they were extraterrestrials. And, um, so there's a lot of information uh, in that regard. And as, as far as the whistleblowers, Stanton Friedman went into this whole thing about how he has you have to lie if you belong to the government. It says, and he showed us the thing, they'll put you, they can put you in jail forever for treason if you don't lie when you're asked about certain things. So that was very interesting. Our government is... Uh, and then, of course, this is all balanced by people like Corey uh, Good and uh, uh, Randy uh, Kramer, who are who are, have been charged with making a, a disclosure possible and, and bringing the runaway civilization that's uh, t- trying to take over the uh, this part of the galaxy. And all of this boils down to we see a major, major. Uh, stirring in people, a stirring of their ambassadorhoods from the extraterrestrials and inner earth uh, beings and the multidimensionals who have uh, decided to help us. And uh, there was, there's some, you know, the old school negativity, David Jacobs, who's a very afraid of what the ETs are going to do, and uh, he doesn't like it, you know, probes very much. And, you know, so put, putting a negative cast on it, but this was all cast away by a wonderful person called Sherry Wilde, who just spoke right from the heart. She's an ambassador, just like Ken is, and, and so are many of you out there. And when you hear Sherry uh, Wilde talking, you know it's just like the, the disciples felt when they heard Jesus. I mean, this, she's the real thing. Aw. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, if I can jump uh, in I'll real fast on that, Sasha. Okay, go ahead, Ken. Yes. No, um, most of you probably know who Linda Moulton Howe is, one of the best um, uh, research reporters, in, in not just America, but all over. She came and did a, a, um, an interview, came over to do an interview with me, and they wanted to come to my house and see the archive directly, the things that I've saved, and got the chance to meet um, uh, Brett and Karen. And uh, in, after she got there at 2 o'clock, it was going to be just for an hour and a half, and she didn't leave till 9.30 once she got to know people. Then she opened up to us and said uh, on one of her personal contacts, who was a remote viewer, that um, uh, did some research for her and said that 2016 is – the year of disclosure so that kind of makes it get a little more exciting for me and then yeah. um her whole re- 
uh, interview and all is on the Earth Files. And um, after a chance to look at it, she has done the research, and she goes into so much detail. Any of the things that I've been attacked in the past by the, the NASA attack dogs, as I call them, and J, uh, JPL, and she's gone back and pulled up the records, their own records, and shown that they're, you know, uh, barking up the wrong tree and that the information and everything that I've kept all these years and making available to the world now um, is the, the truth. And that's really exciting for me not to have to stand up all by myself, but to know that there's a, there's a tremendous team and a tremendous moving, I think, uh, worldwide, because uh, since we, we got the first books put out, we have people from all over the world that are contacting us by email and stuff, and uh, we're uh, talking to them and, and getting them to realize that if they have any information, now's the time they need to come forward. They don't have to worry about it as much as I did to begin with, um, that we'll be targeted, because how can you target people that are telling the truth? That's what we're doing. Oh. Hi. Well, um, I, yes, I, I, yeah, well, it was interesting, you know, working with Linda, Linda Moulton Howe, and, and um, she asked me to do a little bit of research. She said, well, this, you know, the, we need to really kind of unfold this, this, this Ken Johnston story, you know, and, and get the truth out. Um, and she, she, she said, um, do, do you know any more on his story, you know, and, and I, I said, give me, give me a, a couple of hours, you know, and I'll, I'll get back with you. And I pulled up all kinds of information, you know, like, like, um, basically things that proved that Tchaikovsky Crater was, was actually filmed on a, on Apollo 14. Um, and it, it's a total contradiction of, of what some of the attack dogs have been saying. And mm -hmm. they actually, um, I actually found a document, um, uh, that, that states in it, it's actually the command service module transcript from the Apollo 14 mission. And it's a conversation between Edgar Mitchell and Stuart Rusa. And Stuart Rusa was the command module pilot. He was floating around um, orbiting the moon. And it, it states in there that he's looking through a sextant at Tchaikovsky Crater. And ah. what, what the significance of that is a sextant is part of the 16-millimeter camera uh -huh. in the command service module. So um, it, they're, they're lying. They, they do have that film. They've never showed it to the public, and that proves it. Wow. And do you have a copy of the film in Ken's collection? No. No, we sure don't. All, all, all we have is that basically that transcript, and and we. I also found um, one of the um, Apollo 14 um, images of Tchaikovsky Crater when when they were TEIing toward the Earth. It, it's a trans-Earth insertion, so they were leaving the Moon, and they they mm -hmm. caught an image of Tchaikovsky Crater, Tsiolkovsky Crater, and. That, that basically proves that they were on a trajectory in an orbit um, that makes it totally possible that they not only um, went around and filmed Tsiolkovsky Crater once, but probably twice and the third time. Because um, it, it wow. was actually on the third day when this transcript was written. That means that um, Stuart Rusa and, um, was not attached to the command module yet. So they, they were still, he was still in orbit. Oh, uh, he wasn't yeah. attached to the lunar module yet, you know. So they were still floating mm -hmm. around in orbit, and he was taking 16-millimeter film of Tsiolkovsky. One of the in things, interesting things that came out on that is that when uh, Dr. Page had had me show that particular uh, reel, about 15 minutes um, of Apollo 14 as it's going, going around, and um, it definitely showed in the, in the crater the, the five domes inside there. The very next day when I checked the same reel out from the, NASA photo lab and showed it to the um, the public that had been um, painted out and it was very very fortunate that I think well I don't know if you'd call it fortunate or it was just meant to be that Brett was able to find the picture of Tchaikovsky crater where they had painted out but not quite enough to totally obliterate the domes because you can see through the through the the painted area the 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 glow of the five domes in one complete area there, and so it's still there. They didn't get rid of it. That's the problem. When you say, could we get a hold of that film, we need to, to start a Freedom of Information Act to force them to go in their cryogenic storage and everything else and find these films, pictures, and reels, the things that, like the ones that I have that are off the original negatives, as well as the 
16 millimeter films and the 70 millimeter house of black pictures if we could get a chance to to look at the actual real pictures and the real Are films you? then it, it, we'd be able to yes there would be nothing there'd be petitions no yes Right. A big yeah. movement to get this to happen. Yeah, that would really. Uh, but you know, uh, this this larger thing that you raise is that these things aren't accidents. That you have been brought. To the, you know, the chances of uh, you uh, and Brett and uh, Karen being brought together. That all these people that are now coming forth, the alignment of the planets. Now it's so obvious. There's some larger plan, and that the uh, the fractals within us of the Creator of all are operating. Uh, to uh, to save this planet. Oh, <laughs> yes, I agree. Well, um, it, it's basically we we can't really move on until we get our history straight. Right. Well, what's interesting is that I was zero in. I, I zeroed in on Linda Moulton Howe. I started with Linda when I started my UFO Penn State discussion group back in from eighty nine to ninety three at Penn State University. And I sponsored her and brought her to Penn State. I've been kind of tracking her off and on, and sometimes she's more interesting than other times. So uh, I kind of like drifted away for a number of years, and then this year, for some reason, what she was saying stood out. So I found myself drawn to her presentations. And indeed, she was, it's like she finally uh, has arrived into her full awareness and power and. Uh, presence and presentations and everything it's like she's she's there and so um she was talking about some things that no one else was talking about she was the only woman on these disclosure panels and then sherry wilde was the only other woman and it was just amazing the the lack of women that uh, that they're putting up on these huge panels certainly we know well, laura a lot eisenhower was there. oh and laura, was laura eisenhower but it's mostly predominantly male and it's very sad to see uh, that women are hardly ever included and yet women are you know majority of the experiencers having the major experiences so we need to balance this out on that level. But then it was very ironic that um, after getting home, I think right around that period, Linda Moulton Howe contacted you and uh, you guys and came over to see Ken. So there's some kind of connection there. But she's got some powerful information about the Ebens. Um, I, I want to order, I'm going to make a note to order that DVD about the Ebens because it was, uh, and, and uh, information about um, the journey to Serpo. That's what it's about. Yeah, but there's there's the uh, several. The Evens were actually making clone species that have been interacting with humanity, and uh, she was revealing things about um, what's his name, Reagan. And Reagan knew. Reagan knew everything. And so I have a, a separate whistleblower that's been talking about you know his involvement with Reagan as as a agent. Um, that reported to him from Roswell, I mean, from Roswell, from Area 51, and then here's Linda with independent uh, validation of the same information. So, fascinating stuff that's emerging right now. Okay, who wants to be next? Karen, we haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, I'd like to kind of talk about something because you were talking about women on that, pan on the, like, the, uh, citizens hearing panel because right behind us, like on the table settings that we have, was a guy named Joseph G. Buckman, and I talked to him at length. He had a transcript. The first uh, it would be five volumes. He had the first of uh, one of five volumes of these transcripts of the citizens hearing. It was fascinating reading, but you know that was what. Uh, Laura, I mean, excuse me, Linda had directly told me she was only the only female on the entire panel. I could think of a whole bunch of women they could have put on that panel. But anyway, so I'm sitting there reading this transcript, and I, and I decided to look. And boy, she was dead right. I was like, there's Linda. And I was like, dude, 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 more dudes. Here's some dudes. Okay, it was just full of dudes. But it had some of the best, and I, I wish I could have gotten a copy, but it had some of the best comments, by the way. Uh, from Edgar Mitchell, I think I've ever seen. He was, you know, getting to the close, uh, close to the end of his life, and his comments were just way out of the box compared to some of the things that he said before. So, um, this this fellow Joseph Buckman, he also happens to be a Libertarian candidate for uh, Congress. He has Congress in the Utah first district. So, hey, people in Utah, you got a you got a guy there that's uh, on board with the UFO ufology and getting the word out. 
But anyway, this, he's trying to work out all the copyright issues and what, what have you to bring these five volumes of testimony. Because um, it was quite an event. It was like basically equivalent to a congressional hearing, but it was a, I want to say mock hearing. It was, it was not a real, you know, sitting congressman, but former congressman. I'm a, I, I wish I remember the guy's name, but one of the congressmen that was on that panel, I got to shake his hand and tell him thank you for doing that. But that was a really important event that has happened. We've had all, and that really, I think everyone who was testifying was giving their best at that point. They were giving a distillation of all the research. So, I mean, this momentum is building, um, you know, more and more and more and more. And uh, Roswell was, a, like, fun. It had all the dress-up things, and it was a lot of fun. But people weren't making fun. I want to make that really clear. People were having fun with the idea of UFOs and aliens and stuff and, and having a good time. And like I said, I have to say Roswell uh, is an amazing town that has really embraced their high weirdness and, and saying, yeah, this is a part of our history and dedicated quite a bit of resources. I mean, they not only had the museum facility there to have venues, but they also were across town in the Civic Center, and, and they, that's where Ken spoke, I think at least once. So, I mean, it was not going on, and, and the whole downtown area had things going on, they, and they had uh, speakers in other venues I didn't know too much about, but, I mean, they're very serious about it, and, and the people might be wearing an alien costume, but they're sitting asking you some serious questions. I mean, they've thought about this, you know. So I just thought that was really great. So I just wanted to share about uh, that, uh, you know, there's an attempt to get that entire, you know, testimony out. Um, and that's the kind of thing happening is that you now have many, many groups of researchers, and I count all of us and, and the A team here as groups of researchers collaborating together to get, you know, serious bodies of information out there to say, hey, what gives? It's not just stories. It's not just um Oh, I saw a UFO, whatever, which is important, no doubt. You know, I don't care who sees it. It doesn't have to be uh, a first responder, military person, somebody they call credible. I really hate that because when you have a personal experience with, with seeing a UFO or alien contact or whatever, that should be respected even if you're, you know, no matter what. That should just be respected as part of our human experience. But I'm just impressed with the level and intensity of information coming out this year about this topic. So, uh, next person. Yeah. Um, back to I'd like Ken. To jump back. Yeah, Janet, if I may, I'd jump back in on what uh, Sasha was saying a little bit earlier about um, ambassadors. And, and I'm really proud to say that I was shocked in the regression hypnosis where um, I discovered that, that my wife was actually and is one of the. Uh, selected as a, as a child to become one of the ambassadors. And that puts us in a position where we need to, to bring get everyone that has had that type of experience to come forward because we have a, a job ahead of us and not very much time to get it all done. And uh, that's, we just need to stay focused on getting the truth out to the world. It, it's been fascinating getting in touch with people from around the world and finding out that, of course, uh, the United States, Canada, and Great Britain have been the ones that have, have kept the information hidden as, as long as they possibly can, but now they seem to be more relaxed about um, the, the truth coming out. And I had one person talk with me while I was there, and, and uh, Karen, I did. I talked twice at the convention center as well as once over at the museum, both of them, uh, all three of them, hour and a half at a time. But um, this person said that, that we'll be able to uh, get the truth out where everybody can finally see it and, and understand and be able to accept the fact that, you know, we owe our DNA and, and who we are today not just to um, millions of years of evolutions from, <laughs> from microscopic squirms up to intelligent beings, but then we have, actually, I, like, I like, enjoy saying that I now accept the fact that I am part alien. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's going to be interesting, and that's going to come out in the next book that we're writing now, and that is my um, metaphysical experience in which we're going to get into um, the experience that I have had as a youth as well as now. I, I want to find out who the rest of these ambassadors are that um, yeah. I think I had the privilege of seeing. 
and, and I'm curious how your wife uh, responded to your information that she is an ambassador. Was she aware of her own extraterrestrial connections this, this or not? This a little, little strange to believe, but she, this has all hit her right at the minute, right at the, the same weekend that her career, or not her career, her job ended, and she had to transfer over to an, another um, um uh, another company where she's just getting started, so she has not listened to or even heard the the recording of of the hypnotic recession thing. So, but I do know her own personal stories from the we've been married thirty thirty two years about when she was a child and then when uh, she her two daughters and she were alone, where they were um, not abducted, but then let's say that on the second story of um, a window, a gray appearing in the window outside their the second story room and then uh, the effect it had on the kids as well as herself so she she's aware that she is a part of this overall plan and she does have a part in it but until I get it but, well until she's comfortable with her new position and she will take the time we can sit down and go through which we're now transcribing that that well by the way I thought it was only about 15 minutes that I was hypnotized but it wound up it was like two hours and 15 minutes but we'll get it transcribed right. to where we can all look at it and, and listen to it and read about it. So then then I know she's going to be a full full team player of the A-team. Wow, fascinating. And it's interesting that she says it was the second floor because I've seen the grays and they float. They, they That's why I think the story of Casper the Friendly Ghost, the cartoon, came about in the uh, 50s and 60s. If you look at it, they, they resemble the owl, and the owl is the screen memory, and um, that's what they appear to me sometimes. It's like an owl, and then something like that, that ghostly figure. But then when you really look at them up close, or when you get past the uh, the blockage, you you finally get their faces in your mind's eye, and you go, oh, that's what they look like. You know, there there are variations on the gray, but they uh, there are many different species, but they're definitely grays. So fascinating. So she saw one on the second floor. I saw one floating outside the window on the 16th floor. So wow. that's nice validation. Okay, that's back good. to Brett. Oh yes, um, I, I I've gotten a, a chance to to know Fran Johnston a little bit, and and she's a very deep and wonderful soul. Uh, you know, you just you just really get that feeling, you know, when you talk when you talk to her that she's got um, um, she there's a lot of knowledge she she has, you know, and um, I, I I can't wait for her to to you know to look at this stuff, you know, and then see what she really thinks about everything. And um, I I just um, you know I, I I think it's wonderful the direction that we're going in, you know, Linda Moulton House. Um, said that she feels that disclosure will happen, you know, in 2016 this year um, sometime. And uh, that very well could be. Um, now, disclosure will happen this year. It's already, it, it's, happened. It's already happened. You know, it's just a matter of, of who is who is listening and, and waiting for everyone to kind of catch up on that. And, um, you know, while I was down at... Um, um, Roswell, um, we were we were staying in our, our hotel room and in the lobby. You know, I I I, I saw this guy and um, he was Korean, I guess, uh, Asian. And and I I, I said um, um, he 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 said I'm I'm here. You know, he talked talk to the hotel manager and said I'm here to to film the Roswell thing. You know, and all that. And I I I said you know you're you're staying in the room next to Ken Johnston. He goes, oh my God, Ken Johnston. You know. He was so happy, <laughs> and so yeah, we we I said just go down there and talk to him. He's really nice, you know. And and I went I went on the other side. You know how hotels are. You can go through the back door, on the other side, and mm -hmm. he went through the front door. And I guess we knocked on the room door at the exact same time. We didn't know which door to open first or what was going on. <laughs> but it was fascinating to have them there. They they uh, spent a lot of time filming the. Um, the whole Roswell event, and then the last day, <clears throat> they managed to to finally corner me and and sit down and, and get their um, their host who couldn't speak any English, and we had to play the game where 
uh, he would be, they're filming him and he's asking all these questions in Korean and, and I'm nodding my head and agreeing with what he's saying and then he stops and then uh, the the American Korean guy, he starts translating everything and telling me what the guy said, then I answer it. So they're going to have to edit that stuff all out. That was fascinating. <laughs> uh, let's see, just two days ago, uh, I think it was two days ago, we had the, the group down in Mexico City, um, give me names here, Brett, what's his name? Yeah, Mex yeah, Evan Garcia and, and their group, and we we did eight. There you go, and we, we've made eight uh, little pilots that he's going to use for advertisement to promote. It's going to be in August. That it'll be a, a big two-hour special um, down in Mexico City. So that's we're we're finding out that um, people from around the world are open and they are now seeking us out, and I kind of feel like that. Um, the fact of me coming forward with archives that are 40 and 45 years old, depending on which mission you want to start at, and um, and some of the stuff on my Facebook, one of the researchers, he shows the NASA picture that he got, and then he shows the pictures that I've released out in, in my archive, and oh, the difference is difference between night and day. You can see exactly the uh, the alien bases and things that they were looking for, but you can't in the others. So um, hopefully. Hopefully we're doing the right thing, and that's what um, in, in my youth that they picked me for is to be at the right place at the right time to do the right thing. So I'm here. Wonderful. Sasha has it once to say oh, yeah, something. Oh yeah, yeah. Come back to your allusion to uh, uh, Travis Walton and how this he, his uh, journey is so representative of so many uh, people who uh, had experiences and uh, gave them a, a, a negative kind of a connotation. Uh, because uh, they were out of control and they felt like they weren't per given permission. And then as these people became mature, and as this world became mature, as this culture became more mature, uh, people were able to realize that uh, this was ameliorative, not pejorative. For, uh, Walton got knocked out by a blast of radiation coming close to the hull of a, uh, a, a gra an anti-grav ship, and they, they fixed him up and they made him better and they made sure he was safe. And um, uh, many people who are, you know, been sick and dying and so forth have been tuned up by their uh, extraterrestrial uh, sponsors. And as people become mature, just as uh, Travis did, he now looks at his experience, my gosh, they were really kind to me. They were helping me. They saved me. They fixed me. Uh, Janet had experience like that, too, especially with reptilians. Uh, people tend to be afraid of reptilians because they have such a different way of communicating. But when you become more mature, you see that you, at some point you've given your consent uh, to uh, assisting and being part of this ambassadorship to raise the consciousness of humanity. Yeah, we got to hang out with Travis at the uh, Alien Cosmic Expo. They premiered his uh, film there for the first time to that Canadian audience. And it was very interesting going north over the border and being at a conference with all these people that are outside of the U.S. And they're very open-minded. They're in some ways uh, behind us and in some ways way ahead of us on the information. So that's where we have the... Uh, disclosure hearing on Saturday uh, a few weeks ago. We had where's the list? A late read the list. Uh, but it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. Grant Cameron, Stanton Friedman, Nick Pope, Stephen Bassett, Richard Dolan, Travis Walton. They were on a panel. Uh, oh, and uh, Paul Hellyer who is the Honorable Paul T. Hellier. What is his title? He was a former Defense Minister of Canada. The former Defense Minister of Canada. And then Victor Vigiani and Bob Mitchell were the moderators, and there were about six members of the press. So it was pretty much like the hearing they had in 2013, but this time it was over the border. And Victor Vigiani, you can see this YouTube, he said, Here's some documents that I got from the Freedom of Information Act, and I forget how many he had, like 10 of them or something. I've made copies to the press. I'm distributing them to the press right now. I was forbidden by the U.S. government to disclose these, and I said, come and get me. He said, come, he said, come and get me. Come and arrest me, or something like that. It was like, it's like, way to go. So they're out there on that level really bold and brazen um, you know saying we, we want disclosure we want the truth and the truth so it's free 
And then we had a, a Friday, we had Disclaiming Disclosure and Experiencers. And Friday, we had a, an incredible panel with a, a bunch of different people. Where's the panel? Anyway, I can't find it right here. Oh, Joanna Ross, Sherry Wild, Grant Cameron, Sasha and Janet Lesson, Barry Strom, Aussie, Travis Walton, Elizabeth April. And we had endless stream from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. of experiencers who came up and grabbed the mic and told their stories. And the only thing is that the real shy ones didn't come up. They're not as bold and brazen. And perhaps next year we'll create a situation where the shy ones can tell their stories as well that we're working on. But the stories in Canada were a lot uh, different primarily than the ones that we get like at the uh, International UFO Congress. These people really seem to be awake and conscious. And of course the rest of the weekend was uh, rotating between the, the nuts and bolts disclosure people and the experiencers. And we went through to the end of the uh, the whole thing. I was next to last yet at lesson. I did my hero's journey, a personal experience, opposite Aussie, who is wonderful. OC, I think she pronounced it, abductions and procedures. And um, Sherry Wild really stood out. It was a shame because they had two presentations at the same, and I wanted to see them all. And she was opposite Stephen Bassett, who did the truth embargoes and the post disclosure world, and ended with Jason Quick and Bob Mitchell reconnecting the spider's web. So it was a fascinating conference. I highly recommend it. They've already renewed for next year. They've outgrown their facility. They're moving it to Toronto. And Sasha wants to say something. Well, well I know that you uh, you look at the uh, contact with extraterrestrials as the opportunity for a hero's journey. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Um, well, um, yes, everybody has their hero's journey. Everybody has a story to tell. And as Karen uh, points out, that right now we have the need to tell. And I hope to create some way for people to feel safe and tell their tales because it's a piece of the puzzle. Everybody has a piece of the puzzle. And if we just focus on like a, a typical story where everything fits into the box, we're doing the same thing. We need to hear the stories outside of the box as, though, as well as those that are so the, the, the hero overcomes obstacles and gets an elixir, something that will help humanity, and returns to share that with humanity. Right. And so there's a gift in, in everybody's journey. There's an elixir that will be a boon to humanity, which will take us to the next evolution of consciousness and for the grand awakening, which the end result will be like free, clean, green energy systems, cures for all diseases, uh, Cures for the disease of aging, all political systems or a governance that actually works. It doesn't make a huge slave population, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what my goal is. Okay, we're coming up on the end of the first hour. We have a few more minutes. Karen, uh, how about you take us through to the top of the first hour of commercial break? Back to you, Karen. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd be glad to say something about the press situation because it was very interesting when we were at the UFO Congress for the Fox News affiliate there in Scottsdale, Phoenix area, came to the, and I thought, oh, that's great, the press was coming here. But he only wanted to talk to experiencers. He tended to pick really pretty girls who had weird stories. You know, that's fine, all weird stories. It's just that his idea was to kind of make fun of the topic. And I saw the final cut of his report, and it was, it was disgusting. I mean, there you have some of the most serious, you know, researchers in the world. You have some of the best of the best, cream of the crop. And he doesn't want to talk to any of them. He just wants to try to make fun of the topic. It was really disgusting. Um, at the Roswell event, we had um, that Korean program, I believe, was like the second most popular network and one of the top of most popular um, shows on that network. So that was a very high response. And the gentleman who spoke English said that the Koreans are really just learning this stuff. They, this is South Korea. They don't know a heck of a lot about it and came to Roswell to find out and interviewed all kinds of people. So I thought, I thought that was real positive. We had quite a few Internet radio, Internet-based radio shows and radio programs like Jimmy Church and quite a few others. We had um, Open Minds TV. I'm not sure they filmed there, but Alejandro Rojas was there. So, you know, what I see is I see the alternative press is really strong. Um, I'm just not holding my breath about the mainstream press. They're under tight 
you know, controls to do the consensus reality story. But I was just really pleased with the um, the press. The alternative press is getting so incredibly strong. I mean, uh, tons of radio shows. You can listen to UFO programs literally all day long if you want to, and um, you know, every day of the week. And then um, they've moved over to video. A lot, you know, just taking an interest, interviewing people, and Janet's really right about tell you know tell the story. And, and a big example was the table next to us with some people I actually know. James and Joanne Clarkson from Washington State. James is the UFO MUFON director, but real open, open-minded guy, really great couple. And they just retired, so he's written a book, a couple books, and she's written a book, and, and uh, they're sharing their stories that they came down to Roswell. But he was uh, met there in Washington State, a woman by the name of June Crane, who was the secretary, I guess you'd say, at the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base when all the material from the Roswell crash came in, the body, all that stuff. And she actually got to handle some of that weird foil material. You could squish it, you could burn it, you could do anything. It would pop back into the right shape that was strewn all over the desert there at Roswell. And she, you know, had that experience and was under military oath and didn't say a word about it until when she was uh, retired and moved to Washington State on the coast. And then she got cancer. She died of cancer. She basically made a deathbed confession, uh, oh, quite oh, a lengthy Karen. one. Yeah. Karen, tell, tell them what happened um, with that, that, that cute country couple that came with their little video oh, well, camera. Let, let me, yeah, let me finish the, the story. And, and he, he got her deathbed con- confession. Oh, wrote a book. get the pause that. Pause that for the commercial. I will. Back in three minutes. Okay, All right. remember where you are. Okay, we'll be back. <laughs> Join Tammy as she uncovers hidden secrets about the spiritual world of angels, ghosts, and other entities that have been with us longer than we know. Tammy is a psychic, a teacher, spiritual coach, a leader in her field, and will be sharing her information and stories with you. So join us on Tuesdays at noon on Studio A. With Tammy's guidance, you'll find out who has been watching over you from the other side, and soon you will be talking with your angels. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. And aloha, everybody. Welcome back to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And I'm your host, Janet Carol Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and panelist, Karen Christine Patrick, Brett Colin Shepard, and Dr. Ken Johnston on the Sacred Matrix. But before we get back to our panel discussion about conferences and the evolution of consciousness and what's going on right now in the disclosure UFO world, Please go over to the donation button on Sacred or no, on Revolution no on freedomslips.com. Let's get the right name of the website. It's Freedom Slips or freedomslips.com and make your donation a dollar five fifteen twenty a hundred whatever you donate is greatly appreciated and we do thank you very much for your donation which allows Revolution Radio to bring you shows like ours. On an ongoing basis. Thank you very much, Revolution Radio. 
So we left off with Karen, but did you want to say something real quick, Sasha? Let Karen finish your story. Now okay, Karen, forget or get back to your story. We're we're About hanging. About this couple that sent you something. Yeah, and there was something. Okay, yeah. Let, let me finish with James real quick. He he um uh, uh was interviewing a woman from uh, Ocean Shores, Washington, that turned out to be the secretary at Wright Patterson Air Force Base when the Roswell crash material came in. And the main thing is that she basically got cancer and gave a deathbed confession to him, basically. And he wrote her story. It's called Tell My Story. And you just got to check that out. It's a really great book, Tell My Story by James Clarkson. But he's, a, you know, he's an ongoing researcher. There was a UFO crash and retrieval in Washington State near where he was living at the time. Uh, but also, yeah, we were sitting there and a couple, this the African American couple came and this lady was like, hey, I thought of, uh, they were watching the Blue Angels, you know, that jet show that happens, everybody's seen and they're really awesome. And she caught, she was filming them as they were looping around low to the ground and right behind that, um, that, the one of the Blue Angels looping towards the ground, something white, you know, she didn't see it when she was filming, but after when she watched it, something white goes behind it twice as fast. And she goes, is like that a UFO? And I'm looking at this going, oh, my God. That's, it's, and she said, somebody said it was a bird. That is no bird. It's a, it's, it have to be not a bird, not a plane, maybe Superman. But anyway, this white cheek comes <laughs> right behind it twice as fast. And she goes, what do you think? And I said, uh, well, I showed it to Brett. And he was like, oh, my gosh. And so it was kind of nice. We just passed the phone over to James from MUFON. He's going to, you know. Look at him. He passed the phone to one of the national directors. I mean, it was we were doing a research uh, case right there in the room. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Um, and it turns out they're gonna they're gonna look into it because it was, uh, you know, obviously something there, very obvious, and traveling, of course, faster than basically one of our fastest jets we have. So that that's the fun of getting all of us in the room is we can do. You know, we do this on the internet a lot. You know, the beauty of the internet and nowadays is that you can co collaborate with uh, anybody now. I'm always shocked when I see somebody on Facebook. Oh my God, you know, so and so's on Facebook and they're responsive. And that has accelerated. That's like putting gasoline on a fire. It's totally accelerated, um, you know, research because we can all share information and it's Tell the story. Tell the story. Tell my story. That's the most important thing right now. And I did predict 2016 is a year of the need to tell because people are pretty getting pretty fed up waiting for disclosure. They're tired of being told there's nothing there. They're tired of the uh, the pseudo skeptics telling them that they're crazy or whatever. Not qualified to say anything. Hey, if you're just telling your story. You don't have to apply the scientific method. It's just your story. If somebody wants to prove something, right. that's fine. But but you have a right to, to say what you saw. It's just being a witness. And too many times people are uh, put, you know, their, their mouths are shut because it is somebody shames them because they don't, you know, didn't apply perfect science and proof to something. You know, um, much of the time, as we found from working with Ken, is any kind of proof that there is gets um erased from history um it gets you know bought up it gets squelched it gets smudged out you know it's very difficult to have proof but you know when a bunch of us when a, a you know three percent or whatever the tipping point might be the hundredth monkey whatever that is when we get to that point there's no denying it and experiencers is the key it, you, expert that's great if you're an expert and study something that's great but when you've had a personal experience it's a whole Another thing, and I think that the ETs, that is their protocol. They're giving us personal experiences and contact, and the, now we talk to each other, and that is the key to the whole thing. That's the gateway. So, yeah, that's me. Sash, you had something to say? Uh, yeah, sure. When I look over, uh, just I've been going to these conferences for a while, we seem to really have conquered the nuts and bolts. We know that our clandestine, uh, military has had the anti-grav craft for some time. Uh, we know that the uh, there is uh, extraterrestrials. We are on the uh, verge of being a space age. We have Anunnaki and uh, Mayan uh, spacefaring um, people that have been contacting the linkage and other uh, Michael Lee Hill and others uh, and, and Ken to uh, actually help us with disclosure. We may well have government disclosure. Um, although, of course, they'll always disclose with lies in it because they are the government. 
Uh, but we we have a debate in the uh, literature between the people that think the president has the act some actual authority that uh, President Clinton could say, well, I'll, I'll release this, uh, but I won't release that uh, as classified. And others that say, hey, president's out of the loop. There's nothing compared to the clandestine military or even the breakaway civilization. Um, we have um, a, a, a bunch of the U.S. Marines and people like Randy Kramer who've been commissioned way back from the Eisenhower days to try to preserve uh, the government and uh, and from the Kennedys especially to try to take the government back from Alan Dulles and the uh, Nazis that he brought over uh, from an operation paperclip that have taken over the military industrial complex. So we have a dedicated Marines whose job is to go public, to do just what Ken's doing, to tell the truth, because the truth has got the cures for cancer, the cures for radiation, the chance for us to join a much better, more loving civilization. And with that, we pass the baton to Ken. Well, <laughs> the most fascinating part about this is that there are so many other people out there. I know we've got Donna Hare now is getting her information out. And, and I've come across people that, you know, I've never met before, never heard before, but then when they tell their story, their story intermeshes with what I've been saying, and we basically prove each other. So that is disclosure in itself. Um, I think Greg mm -hmm. wanted to jump in and, and add some a little information on uh, Travis Walton when we were, we actually, it was fascinating where we were at the banquet when we were there then taking over. Oh, yes, um, I, I, we, we, got to know, we got to know Travis, and, and he's such a down-to-earth person, you know, who who's, uh, you know has some a lot of introspection, and he's very deep, and it was just kind of neat because we were sitting across from him, and right next to, right next to him was the Betty and Barney Hill exhibit, you know, it was so cool, you know. And, and, um, she, uh, they had the commissioned paintings from, um, from. Oh my gosh, um, Karen can help me with that name, Marilyn. Um, yeah, the niece of, of Betty and Barney Hill. Kathleen um, Martin. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, needed that. And the, there's, um, it, it was, it was just really down to earth. And when we were, when we were having dinner with Travis, you know, he had. Uh, mentioned that, that that Ken had really helped him, you know, um, it, with his own introspection about how how he perceives what what happened and everything to to him. And it was, you know, whether it was positive or negative, he he really um, Ken um, Ken's coming out with his story, you know, was very inspiring to him. That's what he said. Well, I, when I hung up with Travis, one of the things that he came to realize, I watched his, the light bulb go off over his head, he realized that he went out to the craft and got too close. And when the beam hit him, it killed him. He was that dead. Was and so he would not be here if it wasn't for these ETs taking him on board and reviving him. And so what we found from our secret space program and our super soldiers is that, yes, there is a window of time where we, we human beings, have this technology that we can revive the dead. So I'm, wait, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, very Kramer, Kramer, Kramer was killed several times and was brought back by the, by the military, Randy Say, Kramer. Oh, yeah, Randy Kramer's been brought back several times, and he's one of several thousand uh, super soldiers, so however many they have, that they yeah, that, continually... That they. Yeah, so that's fascinating. Okay, who wants to talk next? Raise your hand. <laughs> I can't see it, though. <laughs> I'd like Speak to up. say something. I'd like to say something. All right, Karen. The chair recognizes Karen. Oh, Actually. thank you. Uh, my fellow colleagues. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> this is fine. Uh, you know, we're sitting there, and we're just, you know, this place is fascinating because we have all the, the exhibitors, but we're inside the actual Roswell Museum. So you're sitting there in a little roll of time just looking at the walls at all of these displays. It's overwhelming, really. And I'm looking at this Betty and Barney. I had this fun moment because I'm looking at the Betty and Barney Hill display, and I saw a picture of the young teenage Ka Kathleen Martin, and I was laughing because she was literally across the room. You know, it's like, 
there's the teenage one, and there's the Wednesday one. So we got all finished, and we're all packing up. I asked her about that. And what she told me, and I thought this was really interesting, was the photo came from a Look magazine, which was kind of aimed at young women and teenagers at the time. And the Betty and Barney Hill story was so hot at the time. It was the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. It's an interracial couple. And they were, you know, regressed. And, and they, they gave out all kinds of information. You wouldn't even know unless you were an astronomer. I mean, there was, they, there, it was just right on the money. One of the most um, believable, really, cases that there is. And, and she's the niece of Betty and them. And... Uh, so she told me that that case was so popular that Liz Magazine came out and went to her, grad, her family graduation party and took those pictures and put it in Liz Magazine, you know, as, oh, here's this glamorous, cute, you know, girl that's associated with this case or whatever. And they thought, well, there's just been these times when different cases like Roswell and, and Betty and Barney Hill and other ones were so popular. You know, people were hungry to know that information that literally... The, the press would make a run at it, and then somehow they'd be beat down again over and over and over and over. And, you know, we ultimately find out that there's really only six corporations owning all the mainstream media. And so now, we, we, you know, that process wasn't working. Now we have this explosion because, of course, you know, we all have a media machine right in our smartphones. You can make a video. You can make audio. You can, you know, put it up on the Internet. Now, and also you can film UFOs. I mean, there's way more filming of UFOs now because everybody's at what? A whole studio in their pocket. Um, we're now at this point where, you know, we've, we've outgrown the media. We're like done waiting. I, I, you know, when people go, we want to have disclosure from the president. I always roll my eyes because by the time we get done with those nitty gritty, horrible political seasons where you hate all of them by the end, um, fifty percent are not going to believe whoever said. You know, the, 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 I swear I'm not going to uphold the Constitution. Blah blah blah, lie lie lie. Then you know, the next five minutes they do disclosure or whatever. Half the people aren't going to believe them. If you get a Democrat guy, the Republicans won't believe him, and vice versa. So I mean, um, to me, what I'm saying is the power of real disclosure. To me. It's we are disclosure. We are the people. We're the ones that are telling our government. We're going to say, we the people say, you guys get with the program and and if you're not going to give us information, all of this information is coming out anyway. And not only that, but Roswell, you know, they always concentrate on about like five to ten cases, like Roswell, Randleton, et cetera, et cetera, just a handful of things that happened 50 years ago. But, oh, my God, there's people having uh, contact every day. Uh, Michael H- Lee Hill is, every, you know, constantly filming stuff over Lake Erie. He's had a million views on some of his uh, uh, videos of uh, craft. Um, it, this isn't something that was 50 years ago and then the aliens left us alone. This is going on every day. So you're seeing it. You're seeing it. People just want to tell me their story. And I took the time. Like, if we went to be there, like, okay, tell me. I want to hear it, you know. And I've had so many times in these events where somebody said to me, um, you're the first person I ever told it to. So all of you guys that are experienced, be that person. Be friendly, curious, accepting, listen. Because people are dying to tell it. The need of the year to tell. Because we're bottled up now at this point. And, and some people had military oaths and they couldn't take it anymore. And they had to say something. Like Edgar Mitchell and others. So it's mm-hmm. it's really fun. It's really encouraging. So if you can get to these events, do it. I learned so. I mean, I study this stuff every day, but I learn so much from other people. So it's fun. Okay. Yeah, Sorry, to say something. <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting to see uh, just what the uh, cover ups are when there's a cover up or a uh, false flag. Uh, Richard Dolan has said one of the big tests is when the things start coming out, the information comes out in the beginning, there'll be a local, bunch of local papers and outlets that have diverse uh, accounts, not the standard Fox News type account. And that's that's uh, one thing that happens. Then certain publications start disappearing, like Admiral Byrd's uh, Two Journeys into the North Pole and into the South Pole in 47 uh, were covered in National Geographic and several, and several newspapers. 
papers, and then the CIA bought them all up, so there isn't any anymore. And so, you, so that's a really good thing. What are what is the government removing? Because that's probably going to show you a, a lot of the truth. Anyway, you can tell when the government is lying because that's what it's talking. <laughs> and they're going to make a new Betty and Barney Hill movie. Uh, it's based on uh, Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin's book called Captured. And uh, it's being, the screenplay is being written by Bryce Zabel, who has been uh, a lot of, well, he's, he's very involved with the, um, what is it called, The Day After Disclosure. I think he co-wrote that book with someone who I can't think of right now. I think it might have been Richard Dolan. And, yeah, so that'll be fascinating. I'm not sure this is an article from September 2015. I know it takes a couple years for movies to get, um, you know, cast and, and who's going to play Betty and Barney Hill? That'll be interesting to see. But the original was James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons. And I have loved James Earl Jones' rendition of Barney Hill. If you ever, if you have a chance to see the original movie, it was absolutely fascinating. And it came out in 1975. And I think that was around the same time. Oh, who said a few years later was uh, Travis. So very interesting times. Okay, back to either Ken. Or Brett, who wants to take the talking stick? Well, I guess I'm, I'm here. One of the things that's, uh, I think, the most exciting point here is that the people are actually getting together and coming out and the information is getting out there. I, I, it was a little bit difficult for me to finally say, okay, you know, damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead, let's get the information out there and we'll see how it all turns out after that. That's a little bit of my military talk here, but... That's just the way it is. And then the, the chance now of uh, going back and looking at how did I wind up here, in not in this mess, but in this opportunity, in this timeline. I yeah. Mean, I've, yeah. I've learned so much from Brett and, and Karen and having to do with the communications. And the, a lot of it, it's not what comes out of our mouth. It's what kind of picture and what kind of uh, vibes are, that are being put out there. And this, this trip down to um, uh, Roswell was a tremendous uh, experience for me to be so close to people that have been involved in trying to get the word out and then to find out that some of them are now looking at what we're doing and what my stuff is doing, what we're doing is is it, it's it's helping them deal with what they had. I mean, Britt, you, were, you were talking with Travis a lot there, um, more than I was because I had to get up and go, go check in and check out with some of the other people because we were getting ready to make that three-hour drive back to um, back here at, at night there, but um, what else did you learn from them? Well, um, and Travis doesn't talk a whole lot, you know, he's, he's very introspective. <laughs> um, he, he, um, it was it was very nice to get to know him, you know, and I, I could almost read his mind, you know, I, I asked him, are you, you, you getting tired of telling the story over and over again? And he goes, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So it was kind of nice to see the human side of all of, all of these wonderful researchers that were there, you know. And it was weird because I, I was like I was sitting right there with Travis Walton, and I actually opened up his pop for him, you know. And and I I could feel him, you know, uh, the whole thing. And it it was just it was just very strange because I knew where he was at in his life without. You know, without him telling me, you know, it was it was very interesting. You know, he he just looked right at me, you know, with the blue eyes or whatever, and yeah, you know, I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. I get it, you know, totally get it. So yeah, you know, it, and it, there were so many wonderful people there and researchers, and I was mostly impressed with the experiencers because you could feel them, you know, you you could feel their their energy. You know, you you could you could feel what they had experienced. You know what what was really going on, and I didn't know. I really, truly did not know a whole lot about the Travis Walton story. You know, with the whole lie detector thing and all that jazz. You know, um, I had to actually look it up and do a little research on it. And one one thing that I that I that I found fascinating is that it was at this time when when people were totally clammed up about any kind of alien anything in disclosure, you know? It was it was like almost taboo to even talk about it. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, it, it, basically, Travis 
um, w- without, you know, just having his human experience, you know, paved, paved the way for so many people to come forward. And another person who has done that is Whitley Stryber. You know, he has paved right. the way for, for these people to come forward, you know, with their, with their emotions and their experience. And that's what's important, you know. Not, not, not all the, well, this happened to me and this happened to me and this happened to me and all the facts. That's just boring, you know. The, the, the thing is, is these emotions and these deep feelings that people have all over the world is what disclosure is about. The thing of these deathbed confessions are wonderful and great, I mean, I mean, like uh, Bill Pollock and some of those, but to um, we want them to get, come forward now while they're still alive so they can show that they are for real and that what has happened is real and what, is, what is, needs to happen is real and we all need to be a part of it. Right on. Yeah, I think it's kind of uh, poetic that Whitley Stryker is such an eloquent writer, and he's able to put into words his experiences and his series of books and translate it to the average person so that they can relate to it. I That's one of my early starts was Whitley Stryker, and I'm, I'm really grateful. I, I Unfortunately, I did not get to see his presentation. I wasn't feeling well at that time, and I missed it. But he's just, um, you know, one of the pioneers. And then, of course, watching Travis for 40 years, how he's grown, and he's had to deal with it. And he is, I think it is um, very important that he is kind of a down-home country boy. And he, he's not um, a braggart or full of ego. That he's just a simple folk. And he gives a, he shows people how you can walk through life with grace when you've had something extraordinary like this out-of-the-box experience that has really, you know, literally changed his whole world and all his friends. And, and uh, It's a wonderful documentary, and I'm glad to see they're going to redo Fire of the Sky because they certainly screwed that one up <laughs> the first time around. So I'm looking forward to that re the retelling of the story. Okay, who wants to talk next? Sash, you want to say something? Well, I just would say that, you know, when you have an experience uh, um, with another being, to really look at this concept, is this an another? Is it really an other? Or is there a resonance that you can feel that other being uh, resonate within you and know that you are resonating within them? Then we can get over this dichotomous uh, way of uh, being opposed to uh, someone or something all the time, and we can embrace one another as all part of the same continuum here to uh, inform each other by s- uh, smoky mirrors or harsh mirrors uh, that we are all one and that we're all evolving uh, to back to source. Karen. One of the yeah. things to tag onto that, if oh. I may. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so that is, people, um, now that more and more information is coming up. People are becoming a little more comfortable with getting into their own self, such as um, the the regression session that you did. I'm very much looking forward to, to doing more and going in. And um, mm-hmm. I had questions. People asked me, said, well, have you have you ever had an experience? And up until this point in Roswell uh, last week, I had always very quickly changed the subject, went into things that I knew in this mind firsthand. But then um, the people from Korea were talking, and I finally decided, you know what? I can say, yes, I have. And I, I very quickly said, I said, you're going to get to read more about it in the next volume when we get the next book out. So I'm going to springboarding off of that as a little advertising. But it's true. I, I'm comfortable. I have become comfortable with realizing that, yes, I have had experiences. And there are more people out there like me that, that uh, have had to deal with the dreams or the thoughts or, or the mind of what something has happened, but they, they were kind of afraid to go into it because the way the government here in this country has done is if you even open your mouth about anything that, like that, then you're tagged as being either insane, crazy, or, you know, thrill-seeking. I don't know what they want to call it. But um, finally, I think um, America, Canada, and Great Britain has reached a point. Now, this was the one key I wanted to make a little bit earlier, and that is being – We've made it easier now that our government come back and say, well, yes, yes, 
we have lied, but we did it all for a good reason because that's what Brookings Institute told us we, we should do, that our society wasn't mature enough to be able to handle that. And now that the information has come out and now that people are more comfortable with the fact that extraterrestrials do exist, yes, they are more advanced than us, yes, they may have had something to do with our DNA, that they're now willing to come forward and discuss it. And now this um, is not going to be labeled as crazy, and now the government can say, uh, we, as I said, we, they, we're giving them an out, is what I'm saying. We're giving the government an out, and they can still maintain their supposed control, although it's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people. Now they can say that it was to, to help, and now they're ready to help us all again, and we can get into the anti-gravity. We can take and do things that will help save this earth of ours, this beautiful blue marble, and all because the truth is finally coming out. Right on. Right on, right yeah. On. Okay. Um, Brett, are you there? There's some There's some background noise. Maybe you guys can mute. Yes, I'm here. Mute. Yeah, there's some kind of background you know, interesting noise. about this, uh, uh, the, one of the excuses used by the establishment to withhold information is uh, because of the panic that seemed to uh, follow with the program that um, uh, Orson Welles did of the Martian invasion. But the, uh, I, some of my reading lately uh, from Leith and uh, Sala and others had talked about how when Roosevelt actually had a meeting with some of the extraterrestrials and he said, uh, we've got to tell the public about this at once. It's our duty to let them know. And uh, they said, hey, wait a minute, boss. Let's, 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 see, what, let's uh, see how the public will react. And, and, and so they staged uh, for President Roosevelt this whole elaborate thing. They got Orson Welles to do H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. They made it as scary as possible. They all, people committed suicide and ran to the hills and everything. And they said, see, boss, you can't let them know. And he says, you're right. Okay, let's, let's have MJ-12 and keep it a secret. Yeah, that, that's pretty wow. much the case. Um, it, it, um, that goes all the way back to the Holy Roman Empire, you know, during World War II and Nazi Germany. You know, they, they had, um, we had acquired technology from them, you know, that, that was also mm -hmm. an, inspired from the E.T. Um, real races, or um, they, they call them the Aldebarans and such. And um, there, there were quite a few, all of the spokespeople, you know, in the media that were putting things out about UFOs at the time were all named George, by the way. That was like yeah. a <laughs> And, and you know, what was interesting about that, you know, there was George Adamski, you know, and uh, all the rest of them. Yeah, and their, their, um, their, their whole thing or whatever, you know, um, was to say, you know, um, don't be alarmed, you know, there, there's, there's UFOs or whatever. And, and, and they put themselves out there on purpose, you know, to, to look sort of not really credible, you know. So it was just like a media thing or whatever so that we could fly our German technology around California and other places. And by the way, those are very dated looking UFOs. Those, I actually know what they look like. You know, I've seen them myself, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and not even, not, not even a hundred feet from my car. You know, so I, I know exactly what this stuff looks like. And it's, it's way more advanced than it was in the fifties. You know, that was the old model. That was like the model T of UFOs, you know. You, you had this, uh, you know, little typical um, cake-topped type saucer, you know, that, that looked like a hat, basically. And that was, those were called Hanaboos. And they were very, very typical of German technology. If people would just look at it with, the, with that perspective, you know, or with that, that perception, they, you, you can easily see when you do the research into the old World War II um, uh, type technology that, that um, Schauberg was working on and the others that came over on Project Paperclip. Um, see, our scientists were not at war. They were sharing stuff. It was, it, it was our countries that were in a media, you know, in the media, we were supposedly at war. And the whole thing is completely socioeconomic. You know, that, that's the only reason for that. But our scientists were on the same page. We weren't mad at, at uh, Werner von Braun, who started our space agency or anything like that, you know, the father of rocketry, um, he, he came directly from Project Paperclip in Nazi Germany. You know, so just for an example, the, I, all of their technology came over here. 
Werner von Braun's technology that he brought um, with, with the with the rocketry was um, incredibly ingenious, yet incredibly fundamental compared to what they were actually working on. Yeah, the fuel burning uh, rockets are just a cover up for something much more powerful and much much faster. Uh, there's an American genius named uh, Caldwell who basically went into uh, lived his whole life on bases. Uh, uh, and uh, we've had really advanced spacecraft that have been uh, facilitated in the skin, particularly, and in, in the uh, types of uh, the way mercury was used to make craft that can go way beyond this galaxy. Even now, we've had it for some time. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's we we've had it for you know at least at least uh, that that the public is aware of since the 30s, you know, and even mm -hmm. prior to that. Uh, there, there's, there, there is a fundamental Earth technology, you know, that they are not telling people about, you know, that that deals with the the electromagnetism of the Earth and the toroidal type system that is going around. You know, um, I I truly believe that our ancestors were very much in tune with that energy, and and they could do amazing things. They could move giant, you know, giant. Um, um, massive, yeah, boulders and this and that, you know, the, uh, basically just, just getting together and actually, um, they, I, I believe that they used to do it with frequency, with sound um, technology, you know, because right. I read about that with the old, um, like, Tuat's Dedan and stories and that, um, that, that they used to, to, in the old Pictish stories, you know, Crutane and them. They, they used to they used to get together and they used to hum. They used to go, mm, you know, and and uh, they do it at a hue or a certain frequency um, for different reasons, either to heal the the tribe, you know, or or to actually physically move something, you know. So so it's it's very fascinating um, what our ancestors were able to do when the Earth's magnetic field was at a certain height. Yeah, and they built uh, their, their uh, particular sacred sites, uh, places like Karnak, where there's fault lines and water that runs underneath. And when you get a whole bunch of people meditating in a place, and they're, you're focused on certain constellations aligned certain ways, they're able, particularly in the, in the hours just before dawn, when the piezoelectric energy along the ley lines changes direction, it gives a big burst. And uh, one of the things about uh, the uh, anti-grav craft is... Uh, and for a time, they didn't want to have too many of them going at one time, or it would uh, mess everything up. And so the, the uh, anti-grav craft from Agartha and that from our clandestine military has had to really take that into consideration. There's been cooperation at the highest levels of civilizations within the Earth and those looking at the Earth and with clandestines that are part of this Earth, in my humble opinion. Okay, yeah. we have about a little bit less than a half an hour left for the show. So where do we want to go with the information we want to convey to our listeners? Who's next? I'll go next. Karen, are you? I want to make, okay. yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to make it clear we are maintaining very good radio silence here at our location unless one of us is speaking. So I'm noticing that there's background information is not coming from our location. So this is an okay. FYI. And I wonder if that might be on Sean's end. Sean, if you're listening, could you uh, double check your mic because there's some back, some background conversation conversation coming through. Okay. Yeah, it's quite a bit. Yeah, not somebody's from talking. Us. Not from us. Okay. Okay. Um, somebody's got a mic on. It's not here. We don't have any talk about. Oh, we get. You know, it's, a, it's amazing how often we do get a bit of, uh, you know, crosstalk and electronic noises and everything. Uh, particularly when we're talking about Nazis, you know, that kind of works out. But I, I wanted to say something because I got into, some, you know, you get into conversations you just normally would not get into. And besides the fact that the Nazi paper, the paperclip uh, effort was uh, bringing German scientists. Uh, that were doing rocketry, but also doing anti-gravitational craft. Another group of scientists were the mind control scientists. They were the ones experimenting, unfortunately, 
on people in the concentration camps. A lot of people don't know that the groups of people that they picked that were marginalized, so they picked, like, uh, homosexuals, they picked um, people that were disabled, um, they picked uh, the people that were, like, the, the Roma or the Gypsies, uh, as well as the Jewish people, and then they had all these people, you know, in these camps that were available to them. And they, they you know, created experiments that you morally, legally, and according to the Geneva Convention, could not do, uh, you know, that they did on these people. And one of the things that they did was develop high-level, you know, mind control techniques using um, just everything we had in our arsenal, hypnosis, suggest power suggestion, um, drugs, you know, different uh, psychotronic drugs. And these guys were brought over to the United States and located mainly in California that, that I know of. And, and then there was a base in China Lake, California. And so this is another untold story. I happen to know about it because I was, you know, personally involved. Um, I believe that I was set up to be, to be put into one of the programs for Randy Kramer and Corey Good. Uh, were put in, um, basically, when I was hearing all the testing that they were receiving, I was having a big aha moment because I received some of the same kinds of testing. Um, and also Andrew Bruchazzo, when he talked about, you know, they literally needed to have kids, you know, kids in the program because adults are kind of, they're set in stone already. Their, their belief systems and all are pretty much set. They wanted to get kids, well, I was tested at seven years old when I first Entered the first grade in the California school system. I'm going to just talk through the talking. I'm a little not happy about that right now. But anyway, um, basically, um, so they were, you know, wanted Tabula Rasa, the blank slate, you know, to work from uh -huh. uh, in these children. And they were looking for, for a couple of factors, intelligence. They were looking for psychic um, capacity of some kind. I, I was given the... ESP test with those yeah. ESP cards that have a wavy line and a triangle and a circle and a square. Uh, and I'm supposed to try to guess, you know, what which card it was according to, you know, okay, this is the next one, this is the next one. Uh, so clearly I'm known to my parents, by the way. That I was given a full psychological evaluation and also this ESP test in the vice principal's office was this guy in kind of a rumpily bad tweed suit who smelled of professor. I mean, I think he was some kind of professor. But anyway. Take care of him. Uh, <laughs> he smelled of professor. <laughs> yes, yes. And I don't know who he was. He looked over the top of the glasses at me. I don't know if he was approving or disapproving. Oh, and I did the Rosarch test, you know, the ink blot test, which is a lot for a seven-year-old to try to figure out what's going on. But, yeah, basically they put me in the gifted and talented program. And I tell the story as often as I can because I know there's other people who are triggering off of what I'm saying. They've been through it as well. And there they evaluated us and observed us, you know, they, and then um, I didn't particularly get involved in the part where they went on field trips, but according to other kids, that are now, you know, we call them program kids, Brett and I are both program kids who had, you know, evaluations like this and monetization, you know, all through our school years, and basically um, put us into programs. Now, somehow or another, through some circumstances, I dodged the programs because my Parents got really upset that I was, you know, this was going on. I told them about it, and they took me out of the school system and put me into uh, a, a parochial school, which is a whole other story, right? I kind of think that's a level of mind control, too. But, yeah, but, I mean, I wasn't in directly in that program, but I was monitored off and on. I was aware of it at junior high level and high school level. So then, you know, I guess I, I, guess I washed out. I don't know. I was a coal. And other kids ended up being either super soldiers or psychics or, or part of the Sentinel program or part of the secret space program, which I'm ever more convinced is real since I've been through Ken's material because uh, Apollo stopped at 17. They, they had the um, hardware being on the assembly lines all the way to Apollo 20. Um, Ken has told us if we kept going at the pace we were, that NASA would have had us on Mars somewhere in the 1970s, and I'll let them tell you about that. But I'm just really convinced that they found stuff that they weren't ready to tell the public for many reasons, and so they went underground with what I believe is a secret space program is quite you know well developed by now. Because I mean, I'm I'm a grandmother. I have a seven year old grandson, and it's kind of a situation right. where. That's a lot of years that that just didn't go anywhere, you know. I think all the energy, money, uh, you know, ed ed uh, scientists, resources all went to 
the secret pro- space program, and we've been dinking around with robots in the <laughs> space station ever since. You know, robots on Mars, robots on, you know, robots on Mars. Why aren't they on the moon? How come they don't put robots on the moon? That's kind of interesting. Robots right. on the moon. But they, robots they've been, the yeah, they've been dinking around in near Earth orbit ever since. And we've sat in a, like a, this, this spot in awareness for decades, right? So obviously, they're doing something on the side. The, the financials are there. The technical expertise is there. They have got us, you know, in a holding pattern. So, you know, I, it's, that's got to be one impetus towards disclosure is how many people have been involved in these programs and eventually where'd the money go? You know, like we paid for all these uh, uh, programs and we're not necessarily getting very many, like, like, you know, remote game programs that go, around the moon, and Brett can tell you more about that. They go around the moon probably taking pictures, and you spend a billion dollars for that particular program, and we get, like, a handful of pictures that the public ever gets to see. So, um, you know, that's pathetic. <laughs> it's pathetic. Why aren't they showing us film? That's the other thing. Why are we only getting still pictures and grayscale pictures? All this time, right. we never, especially the moon, we never get color, we never get film. My guess is because the UFO is zipping around, you know? So, yeah, we're having a lot of background right. noise, guys. We'll just we'll plow through. That's my bit. I'll pass it on to Candlebrae. Yeah, who's making all that noise? Uh, Sash, what would you like to say? Oh, just the disclosure. It's not just about the extraterrestrial presence or the interterrestrial presence. But once you start opening up disclosure, you're going to find that the people that have been running the clandestine military, a certain faction of them, have committed all kinds of mass murders and genocides, like the, like the Twin Towers, and uh, basically they're responsible for the murder of millions and the starvation of millions more, uh, and it's just playing us against each other uh, so that uh, we don't realize who's been in control, and uh, so that there's great fear among the establishment. It isn't just that they're taking people for their programs and as couriers and stuff, but these, uh, there's a group of, they are terrible things that they do to children, making children murder other children, uh, making them uh, into couriers, ultimately making them into human sacrifices. And we've been, uh, Monique Lassan and others have been, and, and Richard Dolan's done some research on it too, have been uncovering these terrible things. And that's what's partly what's going to come out. All the money stolen, all the people killed, all the inventions held, uh, uh, all the pollution that's been allowed. Uh, uh, by the uh, power elite that controls things, and if once we have more and more disclosure, then the, our friends who are really trying to help us get out of this matrix can do something. But I think that the critical thing that um, Kissinger's and others have asked for is, well, would you let us murderers get away and not not kill us if we fess up? And maybe that's what we got to do: have some kind of a reconciliation and truth going. That'd be great. Okay, Ken or Brett. What would you like to add? We're almost out of time. In about 15 minutes. Ken, oh, um, Brett, are you there? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Um, yes, I would. I, I just like to say that you know there, there's there is a, a lot of evidence of, of things that are um, that are actually physically our history, you know, that that have never been talked about, you know, and um, the, there are. I'll stop saying you know because <laughs> you know I assume that people do. <laughs> so you right. know that there's that there are, um, gosh, you know we we we've got the evidence you know that that is out there for the public to see, and and there the the avenues that that all uh, all of you wonderful radio people have given us to get it out there. Has has been wonderful because we really you know we can't run a magazine or something or, or a newspaper, or something like that. You know we we could but it would not be as effective at all. Um, it, 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 so it's been a wonderful um, avenue of communication. And what what's what's really unique about about the type of communication that I'm learning about from extraterrestrials is that we don't. We, we will eventually not need to do this anymore, you know, because we'll be able to feel what's going on in, in the morphogenic field. You know, we won't even need to do this anymore, um, and, and we'll, we'll be able to concentrate on things that are incredibly important, you know, like um, 
like having a roof over our head, you know, and, and, and making sure our neighbor has a roof over their head, you know. So, so these, these are things that are, <clears throat> that, that, that I consider highly important, you know, and, and, and as important it is to, to disclose everything, it isn't really, um, um, the, the information, um, like, like I told you so, or, or we found out, and, and, or else, and stuff like that, you know. The, the thing uh, that's, that's incredibly important about it is to rectify history so that we can move on to that place where everyone has a home and everyone is settled and we can make families again. Maybe they'll do a baby boomer thing again like they used to do um, and show a bunch <laughs> of diaper commercials and inspire people to have babies, you know, or something. But we'll be able to actually move on as a society from from all of this negativity and all of this brainwashing and all of this this media hype and and all of this this garbage that doesn't really mean an incredible amount, you know, because most people would just rather go fishing or you know and, and or have the mind space to even be able to do that. So I look I look forward into humanity becoming human again. That sounds great. <laughs> okay, we have about uh, 15 minutes. Who's, Josh wants to say something. Well, I would just ahead. say that one, one way to uh, move toward humanity is to stop the artificial persons we call corporations, which uh, have been had the functions of governance farmed out to them, and then they uh, have the legal right as a private corporation whose uh, leaders aren't responsible for for the crimes they commit because it's the corporation and they have the right to keep things secret. And so I've heard some pretty convincing arguments on NPR that stopping corporations, abolishing this idea that you can escape responsibility for your crimes and restitution for those whom you've uh, harmed uh, by hiding behind a corporation would be a great step. I used to say that Andy Bishago has got a program that can really help in that direction. <laughs> I agree. Okay. All right. So anyway, we're covering a lot of ground, and we only have about 10 minutes left. So this is the round where everybody kind of summarizes what they got from the show, their perspective, things they want to tell our listeners. And I don't know, I think we missed somebody last round, but let's go back to Karen. Closing statements. Karen, are you there? Oh, yeah, I just get, didn't get to the mute button. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> you, you know, I, I've had a couple, you know, I try to, you know, when I think of a concept, I try to come up with phrases that help people kind of lock on to what's going on here. And I thought of two uh, of them and uh, for the fit what we're talking about today. One is the experiencer's path. I think that I see the experiencer's path is the one that gets humanity over the goal line. I suppose it's another simile, but yeah, gets us over the goal line, gets the job done. <laughs> because, it, you know, it's it's it's, you know, okay, uh, proof this, proof now. I, I read an article this week by a guy here in New Mexico who says, you follow Bruce Dale, or there's no more to talk about. He's like, nothing to see here, folks, blah, you know, whatever. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That might be the case if you're talking to people who are just so set on hardcore proof that keeps disappearing. Um, you know, they're bored. Okay, you're bored. Now, why don't you go talk to some experiences and really learn something? You know, I think um, if you're not looking at what is going on with experiences, including lots of people listening right now, you're kind of missing the boat. Um, and then the other one is when I moved to New Mexico, I found out they built this uh, spaceport. It was built by Sir Richard Branson from the Virgin. Uh, I'm a, I have a Virgin mobile phone. Virgin Company. And, his, you know, this was done a couple of years ago, and it's just kind of sitting there with, you know, it's built, it's really cool, but there's, you know, it's a spaceport, it really is a space, there's no spaceship landing there, I guess they had a high hopes, but the idea was he was going to, you know, have like a shuttle type thing and take, you know, there's a billionaire that wants to take millionaires to space, you know, they pay a million dollars, they get a ticket, they go up in space, they experience weightlessness, and that's supposed to, and maybe that Samadhi thing that Edgar Mitchell always talks about where you really see the Earth. And there's no lines, you know, where the, on the on the globe, you know, where the countries are. Um, you know, mm -hmm. have some experience. And the thing was, was in it, it was done, and it just didn't go anywhere. Then they have built their craft, but it crashed. And there you go. I, I think uh, this is my other phrase. 
ticket to space. What's the ticket to space? I mean, I know we have a breakaway civilization, but they don't seem to be able to break away enough because they're requiring billions of dollars from those of us on the ground. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still paying for them to be up there. So they're not independent. What's the ticket to space? The ticket to space for us to be a truly space-bearing uh, planet is we provide for everybody on the planet. You're not a mature yeah. country. You're not a mature planet. If children starve in the street and people are bought and sold and people are homeless and people don't have enough food, that is not a mature, ready for space. Who would want you out there? If I'm an ET and I'm looking down at the Earth, it's like, please keep those people on their planet so they figure out their stuff. You know what I mean? So that's the other thing. To take to this space is to take care of everyone in your civilization adequately. Not to have one guy have billions of dollars and some people have nothing. That's that's not how it works. And, so Mr. Branson, your ships are going to keep crashing and you're going to keep having, you know, t- technical problems until you, sir, and the rest of you guys in your club realize that the rest of it, you know, right now we have 84, well, no, it was down to 62 people owning half the world's wealth, and one of them is the queen, by the way. That right. that ratio is crazy. That, that that Half of what they have belongs to the rest of us, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm radical, you know, so that's my statement. <laughs> there you go. But I agree. I agree. <laughs> okay. Uh, next is Ken. <laughs> Yes, uh, well, the <clears throat> main thing I'd like to see is that people that really want to <coughs> know for sure and be able to see the real things, they could go to KenJohnstonMedia.com and then have an opportunity to kind of join the team that's getting in there and, and actually looking at what I've had for 45 years. And it's, it's time that everyone gets in and we all work together. It's that, as um, Karen mentioned earlier, it's that 100 monkey, and I think we're about ready to dump about 100 million monkeys into doing the research and making it where it can't be kept secret. In fact, it, it is not secret anymore. It just be, needs to keep making progress in perhaps a viral way till it's um, all over the world more than it already is. But I mean, in, particularly in America and uh, uh, Canada and Great Britain, I, I love it down in the South. People in Brazil or, or in South America are just wild with information on what we're doing and what's going on down there people in Asia, uh, and even Russia, they've all way ahead of what the public in those countries have. I was a little shocked, though, with our Korean guy, because he was telling in, in Korea there's only one person that really believes in UFOs, and he said that he was it, so <laughs> it all depends <laughs> on that people. <laughs> but I disagree with him there, because I've got other Korean friends, and there are just as many people there that uh, are willing to sure. look at evidence. The problem is, is right. It, in these closed societies, if they can't, um, they don't have access to the information to be able to do the research, to be able to make a an intelligent decision about is it real or is it not. And that's where I think <laughs> what I have said and what we've just now, the A-team has put out to the world is now everyone has access to the information to be able to take a look and see have we been lied to, is it real, is it really out there, what's the next step. Where are we going from here? And, and, and I like what um, uh, SpaceX is doing. They've got the price down, Karen. They got the price down out of only two hundred fifty thousand to, to uh, get yourself a ticket to go to Mars. And by the way, just because they said that I'm too old, I could I had a lot more fun in Roswell telling people that were saying, well, you know, how come you didn't get to go on that? And I explained finally they said I was too old. But I'm dyslexic and I'm only thirty seven, so I've still got that ticket. I'm ready to go. <laughs> That's great. Sasha, you had something to add? Oh, no, I just had my final statements. When okay, well, let's let's have Brett uh, talk. Uh, Brett, are you ready to talk? Yes, I'm I'm here. Um I, I I would just like to tell tell your listeners, you know, that um the 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 key to to all of this is perception. And and you know, as great as the evidence is in space, you know, the the pictures that we have from space that were doctored, you know, and all of that, is, is wonderful evidence and um, that, that points us in the direction that there is life out there. Um, I've literally seen bases on the moon. I've, I've literally seen giant um, megaliths on on um, Mars's um, Mars's moon, Phobos. You know, I, I, I've I've literally literally seen 
some of these things in space images. Now, the, the thing about these space images is that they were done at a time when there was no airbrushing. There wasn't anything like that, you know. And, and, and the only ones that I really look at and take, um, take or consider them like actual evidence is the older space images from Viking and Lunar Orbiter and um, uh, some of the non-doctored uh, Apollo images from Ken. And they're, they're, those are great evidences. We can just look at our around our planet and see how diverse life is on Earth. We have every race represented right here on Earth, whether it's whether it's bugs or animals or we have a representation of of all of the genetics that came from space, and it's 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 like a giant garden, you know. It's really fascinating, and that that is the key thing is perception, you know. We to to look at um, who we are. And to have a little bit of introspection um, on some of these things um, that are deep inside of us that we haven't been told, um, it, because facts are are usually lies, and I, I can just I can say that with some clarity, that that facts are not coming from your own human experience. If you want the truth and you want that actual truth, it's inside you. I agree. Sasha. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, say, you know, the, do the dominant ethos, the uh, matrix that we live under, was do was given us uh, by the Anunnaki, who are uh, people that came from uh, uh, Sirius C, settled on Nibiru. These these were the royals, and they have a, a, a and they had a thermonuclear war, and basically they came out with a, a military dictatorship and a, a king, and they basically have perpetrated a ideology of racism. That some people with certain genes are better and their lives are more uh, important than others. But all lives matter. Every life has its own light to shine. And uh, we don't need any monarchy and we don't need any dictatorship. We just need to honor all life. I agree. So <laughs> this has been a fascinating show. And I really appreciate everybody coming on today. Uh, what websites would you like to promote before we end here, Karen? Would you like to be the spokesperson to tell people how they can find out more about you and Ken and Brett and your work? Uh, they can contact me directly, Karen, C is in Cat Patrick at gmail.com. Of course, I'm on with you on AquarianRadio.com. We do a lot, have a lot of fun with that. Those shows and the people we talk to, um, let's see, uh, I think people can, if they want to check out what happened at Roswell, just go on to look at the Google Roswell UFO Festival, and you'll see lots of pictures that they put up. Um, uh, at the end of the whole thing, the director said they'd had something like a 17% increase. Uh, if they keep going like that, we'll have the whole entire town, pretty much the Roswell Festival in a few years. I hope that happens. Um, becomes like, you know, uh, <laughs> Burning Man or <laughs> something like that. But, uh, yeah, just check those out. Um, that's, oh, and also on, uh, Facebook, the Earth Anomaly Research Society, uh, Lunar Anomaly Research Society. Brett and I are both admins. We're about ready to, I really want people to go to the Earth Anomaly Research Society. We're so close to becoming 5,000 members. I need some more people to join. But we talk about all kinds of things, UFOs, crop circles, sinkholes, um, volcanoes, everything. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, people just talking about all the weird stuff on our planet. So there you go. That's for me. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming to our show. Our, of course, our our major show where we keep all these archives of the radio presentations that we're doing is AquarianRadio.com. And, of course, what we're tying in on these shows is the Anunnaki uh, experience throughout time, from ancient times to modern times to the moon and Mars and beyond. And the major website for that is EnkySpeaks.com. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Karen, Ken, Brett, Sasha, Janet, listeners. Love and blessings. Aloha. Aloha.